your message in person, utilizing both traditional approaches and social media. Next slide, please. So my name is Robin Grant, and I'm the Director of Public Policy and Advocacy at the National Consumer Voice for Quality Long-Term Care, or Consumer Voice for short. Next slide. So for those of you who may not be familiar with us, we're a nonprofit organization that advocates for quality care for consumers receiving long-term services and supports in any setting. So that includes uh, services at home and within the community, um, in assisted living, and um, within a nursing home. So today's webinar is the third of a four-part advocacy skills training series that we're offering. And uh, before we end today, we'll share information on the last advocacy training webinar um, that will um, be coming up in, in August. But the goal of this series of webinars is to give you strong or even stronger advocacy skills. Um, so that you can advocate not only for what we'll be talking about, which is registered nurse coverage in nursing homes, but in fact for any cause or goal that you as an individual or um, as an organization, as a group, maybe as a coalition may have. So these skills that we're going to be um, covering are applicable to um, any advocacy that you can do um, either as an individual or as a group. So the Consumer Voice is currently working on a campaign to get 24-hour registered nurse, and I'm going to refer to um, registered nurses as RNs, um, in nursing homes. So in this advocacy skills training webinar, we're using this issue as our training example. And that way we hope that you can take the skills that you learn, and if you choose, uh, and we hope you will, you can apply them immediately. But I do really want to stress that we're using the issue of 24-hour RN coverage in nursing homes as an example for training purposes. So the skills we're talking about today, um, how to use traditional and social media to deliver your advocacy message, can apply to any advocacy issue. And um, in a similar vein, we're going to be talking about uh, members of Congress as decision makers, um, again, because that's part of our training example. But the decision makers um, can be nursing home administrators, corporate nursing home owners, state agency directors, spouses even. So um, while we're using uh, legislators, this is not just about legislative advocacy. So next slide, please. Okay, I want to tell you a little bit about what we're going to cover today. We'll begin the webinar by giving you information about this issue of round-the-clock uh, RN coverage in nursing homes and um, a bill in Congress that would uh, require all nursing homes uh, receiving money from Medicaid and or Medicare to have an RN on site 24 hours a day. After that, for those of you who could not join us for our um, first and, and second webinars, we'll talk briefly about two areas that we previously covered that you need to know about for this webinar. So the first is how to develop a strategy around an advocacy issue using a tool that we refer to as the strategy chart. And the second is what we call the big six, six points you need to include in developing an effective advocacy message. So after we cover those um, two areas, then we'll get to the meat of this webinar, which is how to deliver your advocacy message through traditional um, approaches such as letters and email, and through social media um, methods like Facebook and, and Twitter. So joining me today as a presenter is Mary Beth Williams, our public policy associate, who is my partner in our policy work. Before we start, I just want to cover two quick housekeeping points and logistical points. First, um, as you've probably noticed, all of your lines are muted now and will remain muted uh, throughout the webinar so everyone can hear the presentation without background noise. So we're going to answer questions at the end um, of our presentation, but 
if during the course of the presentation a question pops into your mind and you want to ask it, you can go ahead and do that by typing it into the box that says questions and chat on the right hand side of your screen. We'll save your question to the end when we have our formal um, question and answer session, but um, feel free to ask it um, in writing at any point. And second, just so you know, in terms of the materials for the webinar, um, we will be emailing you a link. Um, in fact, I think we already have done that, but we will be getting out a recording of the webinar um, to all of you along with um, um, that's combined with the PowerPoint slides. So be looking for that. So finally, um, next slide. I'm going to turn things over to Mary Beth, who's going to talk to you about 24-hour uh, registered nurse coverage in nursing homes. Mary Beth? Great. Thank you, Robin. So before we go any further in today's webinar, we wanted just to provide you with a brief overview of the issue that we'll be using throughout today's presentation, um, which is one of our, ma our main policy priorities as an organization this year. So many of you might have heard us talk about this bill prior if you've participated in the other webinars. But for the people that are new, we wanted just to provide a brief overview so you have some reference for the issue that we'll be referring to as the example throughout today's training webinar. And that issue is advocating for the passage of HR 952, the Put a Registered Nurse in the Nursing Home Act. So this legislation was introduced by Congresswoman Jan Schakowsky of Illinois in February of this year, and it's pending in the House Ways and Means and Energy Commerce Committees, where it has to pass in order to move any further in Congress. So why is this bill so critical? It would require nursing homes that receive Medicare and or Medicaid reimbursement to have a direct care registered nurse on duty 24 hours a day, seven days per week. We firmly believe that an RN must be on duty 24 hours a day because she or he is the sole nursing professional in a nursing home who can conduct nursing assessments. Per current federal regulation, nursing homes are only required to have an RN on site in the building for eight consecutive hours each day. So under current rules, that RN does not have to be a direct care nurse. That RN could work in an administrative capacity. Now there are some limited number of states that already require a 24-hour RN, RN on duty 24 hours a day in a nursing home, which is excellent. Um, but the majority of states in our country do not re make this requirement. That's why we feel federal regulation is so critical. And we just want to emphasize as well that licensed practical nurses and certified nursing assistants play critical roles in nursing homes. They're so very important, and what they do, they they contribute so much to the nursing environment and nursing homes. But unfortunately, not having RN on duty 24 hours a day means often that these professionals have to practice outside of their scope, what is legally determined to be their scope um, in states. And, and that puts these individuals in precarious situations. Um, and unfortunately, that also leaves the residents in the situation where they're not receiving the assessment skills and things that RN solely um, are are licensed to provide, so that's why this is so critical. And also, over the past two decades, the medical intensity and complexity of care for nursing and residents has increased dramatically. A resident who is elderly, frail, and has multiple complex conditions may be discharged from the hospital to the nursing home only one to these two days after surgery for a fractured hip. So this requires expert nursing skills to anticipate, identify, and respond to changes in condition ensuring that appropriate rehabilitation and maximizing the chances for a safe and timely discharge home. So this high level of skill and knowledge for oversight and care is, again, needed 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Our in coverage for only eight hours a day leaves residents vulnerable, undermining effective prevention of complications and possibly delaying important in interventions. So in addition, the absence of RN staffing for up to 16 hours each day means there's no one present capable of assessing and responding when a residents' medical conditions suddenly change or deteriorate. Now, how do RNs help to improve nursing home care? Again, as we mentioned, RNs are the only nursing personnel with the education and licensure to conduct head-to-toe physical assessments, interviews, and record reviews in order to draw conclusions about nursing diagnosis. 
appropriate nursing interventions and care planning, to continuously monitor and evaluate interventions, and finally, to lead the healthcare team in providing care for each resident. RNs are also the nursing home staff members who work directly with residents and other medical professionals to develop plans of care that promote residents' highest level of health and well-being. Higher RN levels result in lower antipsychotic use, fewer pressure ulcers, less restraint use and cognitive decline, fewer urinary tract infections and catheterizations, less weight loss, and less decrease in function. Of particular relevance to today's healthcare improvement initiatives is that decrease in unnecessary hospitalizations of nursing home residents. And research has shown that savings in hospitalizations pay for the increase are in time. So as you can see, passage of HR 952 to put a registered nurse in the Nursing Home Act that would give nursing home residents access to an RN 24 hours a day, seven days a week is critical for quality care. This is why we as an organization are strongly supportive of this bill and why we'll be using it as an example in today's training. Now I'm going to turn it over to Robin who's going to give you an introduction to the strategy chart tool. Okay, thank you Mary Beth. Well, the strategy chart is a tool that can be used to think through and plan an advocacy campaign. It can be used by an individual um, or a group or a coalition. Next slide, please. Okay, um, what we're going to do is want to talk about the various components of the strategy chart by using the strategy chart that we at Consumer Voice developed to advocate for the 24-hour RN coverage um, issue that Mary Beth um, just outlined for you. So next slide. I'd like to walk you through the different components of a strategy chart and then how we at Consumer Voice filled um, and, uh, out each of the, the components and, and addressed each of those elements of the strategy chart. So as you can see uh, from your slide, there are five key areas that are included in a strategy chart. And you need to sort of think through um, and develop each of those areas uh, prior to beginning any advocacy campaign. Um, so you can see that the, the areas are issue goals, organizational considerations, constituents and allies, decision makers and opponents, and tactics. So obviously the most important place to start uh, is determining what goals you have in your advocacy campaign. And so here you're thinking through what exactly is it that you want to achieve. So um, these are um, goals are, are victories that you are striving for. and there are three different types of goals that you need to consider when you're completing your strategy chart. So the first, as you can see from um, column one, is vision. Here we're asking ourselves, what is our big picture goal? You know, what do we want to see happen in the long term? So this isn't something that we see as being achievable in the immediate future, but we're, what we're working toward. So in terms of our 24-hour RN issue and our goals at Consumer Voice, we've put that our vision is adequate staffing for nursing home residents. This is our big picture, long-term goal, ultimately what we want to achieve. We believe that we need adequate staffing because right now um, there are just not enough certified nursing assistants and nurses um, in nursing homes to care for the residents. Um, nursing homes are, are, are not um, you know, putting adequate numbers of um, nursing staff out on the floor in order to care for residents. So as we all know, most nursing home residents need some type of help with activities such as walking, eating, going to the bathroom, getting out of bed. Others need supervision or have complex medical conditions. So unfortunately, chronic understaffing in many nursing homes across the country really harms residents and prevents them from getting sometimes even the most basic care that they need. So currently, there are no federal requirements for minimum staffing standards. And um, as you just heard from Mary Beth, there are no requirements for a registered nurse to be in a nursing home 24 hours a day. So right now, each nursing home can decide for itself 
how many nursing staff um, to assign during the day on each shift. So our long-term goal is to change that and attain adequate staffing round the clock for nursing home residents. Under the vision, you'll see that it says demand. So the demand is an immediate objective. It's something that you think you can achieve within, oh, maybe the next year um, to 18 months. It moves you toward your long-term vision. It's realistic, it's achievable, it's specific, concrete, and measurable. And it is something that you win from someone with the power to give you what you want. So at Consumer Voice, we've decided that what could be achievable at this time is mandating that all nursing homes that get funding from the Medicare and or Medicaid programs provide RN staffing 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And to achieve that goal, our demand, our very specific demand, is to pass HR House Resolution 952, and that's the bill that Mary Beth talked about. But in the course of our advocacy, what if we don't have enough power to achieve our demand, um, despite our best advocacy efforts? You know, what happens if we misjudge how much power we have? So that's where a fallback position comes in. So the fallback is basically your plan B. You want to think in advance about what you'd be willing to accept if you can't get everything you want. Um, this is the, the C word, um, compromise. What could we get um, that would still move us toward our vision but wouldn't be as good as our original demand? So in the case of the 24-hour RN staffing, um, one of the concerns we've heard is that nursing homes in rural areas may have uh, difficulty finding RNs um, to hire round the clock. So our fallback is if we can't get um, the, the requirement, the full requirement to have 24-hour RN coverage, our mandate would be to still require Medicaid and Medicare nursing homes to provide staffing around the clock, but allow some exemptions or, or waivers that would permit facilities under certain circumstances to um, waive the requirement of the 24-hour RN coverage. So again, this is our fallback. We hope we don't have to go there, but it's really important, particularly if you're working with other groups, to think about your fallback position in advance and agree on it. You don't want to be uh, left there at the 11th hour with uh, one person um, making a decision for an entire group. You want to think um, this through well in advance. So that's the first column of the strategy chart. Next on the strategy chart, are organizational considerations. So this is where you analyze what resources you as an individual or an organization or a coalition have that can help you achieve your demand. So you want to identify what strengths and resources you have now and then what you would like to have by the end of the campaign. So the idea here is to get a twofer. We really like uh, twofers in, in our work because it gets you, um, um, you cover more mileage that way. So the two for here is that while you're conducting your campaign, you also want at the same time to build and grow your organization or your group and grow your own resources so that you come out stronger at the very end of your campaign. So you start by looking at what you have right now. You think about resources like how much money you have, how many supporters you have, maybe what communication tools you have. So on um, our slide, you'll see that we've done that for Consumer Voice. We've identified that we have 4,614 individuals in our action network, which is the network of um, individuals that sign up and get alerts from us to take advocacy actions. And these are the folks that we mobilize to help in achieving our demand. We also have uh, 20 national organizations that uh, last Congress signed on in support of the Put a Registered Nurse in the Nursing Home Act, so we know that they're likely to support us again. We also have 114 state, regional, and local groups, such as local and um, uh, state ombudsman programs, resident family councils, citizen advocacy groups, 
these groups um, signed on in support of last year's RN bill. And um, again, we're um, uh, fairly confident that they will uh, be likely to support the bill again this year. We've also identified uh, social media as one of our um, uh, strengths. We have uh, very active Facebook and Twitter accounts, so we can reach out to individuals about our advocacy efforts. Um, I think we have, I guess now we have just reached um, 2,000 uh, followers on Facebook. We have over 3,000 followers on Twitter, so that's another resource that we can use to help support our campaign. Um, as those of you who get our action alerts know, we also have a tool that we internally call Salsa. It's an online tool, uh, and we use it to send out those action alerts, and um, they serve to inform people about policy issues and allow people to, to take action, and that helps us to achieve our demand as well. And in addition, we have um, a very engaged and dedicated, albeit small, staff here at the Consumer Voice. Uh, we have a leadership council, a governing board that are very committed um, to achieving this issue of adequate staffing uh, in nursing homes and our specific demand of 24-hour RN coverage. And then lastly, we have some funding. Um, we were fortunate enough to get funding for a staffing campaign. Um, we are, um, you know, the, the funding was from uh, 2013 to through the end of this year, so we realize we're coming to the, the end of the funding, but um, that has been supporting our advocacy around the 24-hour RN coverage issue. So we have assessed and written down where we are right now and what strengths and resources we bring to this issue. Then you can see um, lower down in the column where it says then at the end of the 114th Congress, so we're targeting the end of this congressional session, um, we want to think about where we would like to be. How do we want to grow our organization? So in this section, you want to be very specific. So you want to say something like, we'd like to raise $2,000, so a very specific amount of money. We want to increase our membership by 20%. These are things that are concrete so you can measure them so that you know that you've been successful or, or perhaps not. So what you see on the slide is what we um, at Consumer Voice have decided to set as our growth goals. We want to increase our action network to 5,000 uh, individuals, add five additional national allies to support the bill, so our number will go from 20 to 25, increase the state and local organizations that are supporting the bill um, from 115 to 150. We'd like to get 25 retweets about the bill on our Twitter page, and then finally, to continue the campaign, we would like to secure an additional $10,000 in funding. So that's where we are now and where we want to go to become even stronger. The next column of the chart looks at what constituents and allies you have that you can rely upon to support your campaign. So these folks, constituents and allies, they're the people who care about this issue and who are going to help you achieve your demand. So they're groups and individuals who believe in what you do um, and, and are supporting you around one particular issue. Um, so constituents are, you can think about them as the people who make up your network. Um, so if you were um, an organization that had paid members, these would be the people who are your um, members. We think about um, our constituents as the folks who are in our network, and that includes folks in our action network and folks who actually are paid members. And you can see that they are um, long-term care consumers, family members, citizen advocacy groups, individual advocates, long-term care ombudsmen, resident councils, and family councils. So those are our constituents. And again, constituents are the folks that support you on all your issues. They're your people. But then you look at allies as well, and allies are very important. They're the folks who may not be interested in joining your organization, um, may or may not support you on other issues that you work on, but they will support you on this particular issue. 
so they care enough about this issue to help you achieve your demand. So in terms of the RN issue, our allies uh, include the national organizations that have already indicated support. And these are organizations that we can and will be going back to for support as we work through the legislative process. So I'm not going to read this uh, long list, um, but you can see who they are um, on the chart. One other point about allies, it's really wonderful if you can get uh, what we call unusual suspects on board with you. So when you team up with a group that is not normally associated with your work, it really gets uh, people's attention and can um, strengthen your efforts. So it's always good to think about if there are some unusual suspects out there. Next up on the chart is decision makers and opponents. So decision makers are those individuals that you're working to influence with your advocacy. And there are two types of decision makers. First, you'll see that there are primary decision makers. These are the people who have the power to say yes or no to your demand. You always want to make sure that the primary decision maker is a real person or persons, um, not an institution. So, for instance, you wouldn't say that your primary decision maker was Congress or the state legislature. You would identify specific individuals. So it may be senators or representatives. Um, and then it's even better if you can drill down even more and identify individual sen senators or representatives who might be primary decision makers. So for example, that might be the chairperson of a particular committee in the legislature or in the Congress. For the RN bill, there will actually be a series of primary um, decision makers, of different decision makers, as the bill uh, works its way through Congress, or I should say, hopefully works its way through Congress. So um, that does raise the point that the strategy chart is a um, living, breathing document. It needs to evolve and change over time. So what you're seeing here right now is where we are currently in the campaign and what we're working on. But over time, um, we hope that, for example, our primary decision makers may change as, as we get farther along in, in the process. So um, the bill is uh, the HR 952 is currently assigned to the House Ways and Means uh, Committee and the House Energy and Commerce Committee. So that means that at this point in time, the members of those committees are our primary decision makers. They have the power to say yes or no to whether HR 952 is passed out of the committee. And that determines whether the bill will continue uh, to live um, or die. After that, uh, if it passes out of committee, it goes to the full House. So then the next set of primary decision makers would be all the members of the US House of Representatives. And then it kind of goes um, uh, down kind of the hierarchy. Um, further down the road and later on your chart, where it says later, if the bill passes out of the House and is sent to the Senate, then you have a similar process. It goes first to the Senate Finance Committee, because that's a committee that deals with Medicare and Medicaid issues. So then members of the Senate Finance Committee become the primary decision makers. And then if the Senate Committee, Finance Committee, passes it out of their committee, then it goes to the full US Senate, and they all, all those senators, become the primary decision makers. And then last, um, but um, truly not least, the highest primary decision maker uh, in this legislative process is the president who has the power to sign, the, put a registered nurse in the Nursing Home Act into law. But right now, for our demand, we are focusing on members of the US House Energy and Commerce and Ways and Means Committee. Those are primary decision makers. Secondary decision makers are people who don't have the power to give you what you want, but they have influence over the primary decision maker that does have the power to say yes or no. So secondary decision makers are really important because they can help you pressure the primary decision maker. So for example, in the legislature, um, a secondary decision maker could be a staff person 
who works for a legislator. Um, in a nursing home, if the administrator were the primary decision maker, a secondary decision maker might be the director of nursing. So for the RN bill, our secondary decision makers are the staff of all the primary decision makers we just identified. And just because they're called secondary decision makers doesn't mean that these folks are not critically important. Um, they can be a really significant way to influence the primary decision maker. So I know sometimes people feel, um, particularly if they're dealing with an issue in Congress, that if they are speaking to a staff person, it's somehow you know, a you know, second class. That is not the case. Those folks are critically important. Um, there are the folks, actually, that you really will be uh, meeting with primarily if you're dealing with a congressional issue, and they, um, they have a lot of power and influence in terms of what they um, pass on and recommend to their um, uh, member of Congress. So never underestimate um, the, the power of secondary decision makers. Finally, um, you need to identify your opponents. These are the folks, the organizations or individuals that are going to use their time, talent, and treasure to make sure you don't achieve your demands. And right now, um, we've listed as our opponents um, two nursing home trade associations. One is Leading Age, which represents uh, not-for-profit nursing homes, and then the American Healthcare Association, which primarily represents for-profit. Uh, nursing homes, and then the American College of Nursing Home Administrators. So now we arrive at our last column, which um, has to do with tactics. Uh, these are the, the actions, the direct actions that you take to put pressure on the decision makers to make them give you what you want. So tactics are uh, a means to the end. Hopefully, they're, um, they're fun. They're things that your members or constituents or ally, allies feel comfortable doing. Um, hopefully, maybe they're media worthy, they're creative, uh, unexpected. They can include things like petitions, postcards, social media campaigns, uh, in-person meetings, letters to the editor, marches, sit-ins, chaining yourself to fences, things like that. Um, anything you can think of that um, uh, can help bring attention to your issue, and um, it's always nice if it's kind of clever and, and uh, attention-getting. So your tactics should reflect your best thinking at the moment, but will definitely change over time based on how the campaign is going. So sometimes something happens um, that is a perfect hook for an issue, and you want to capitalize on it. So, for example, if a major story broke that related to your issue, you might you know, stop what you're doing and do a press release with a statement um, or a letter to the editor because that issue um, is out there, it's, it's um, current, it's getting attention, and you want to use it to connect it to your issue. So this slide describes our tactics. Um, again, these are the actions that we have identified to help us achieve our demand of passing the RN bill. And to give you a concrete example of what we're doing, we've um, got on the chart both actions we've already taken and actions that we have yet to take, just so you had a sense of, of um, what types of efforts we're making. Um, our first action is to conduct in-person training. So we've been doing that uh, around the country. We've done nine so far, one to go. The idea here is to equip people to advocate for this bill. We've conducted a national webinar on this issue. We've organized a Contact Your Legislator Day. Um, not listed here, but we hosted a briefing for staff members of the House. Um, as a, ta a tactic within a tactic, we use um, an ice cream social as a way to bring people to um, the briefing, which uh, I must say it turned out to be very successful. So ice cream socials are high up there as a way to um, br bring uh, a crowd in and uh, get good attendance. So one thing to keep in mind is to try to come up with different methods that um, a range of people can use. So you want to make sure the tactic is appropriate to you know, different groups within your network. 
um, your constituents. So for example, we use action alerts as a tactic, and that's great for people that have a ready access to a computer. But it's not so great for folks who don't have computer and internet access. So while we have online tactics, we need to have tactics that aren't. So for example, we'd want to do something like a petition um, to representatives. You also want to have like a mixture of written tactics and in-person tactics. So you'll see that in addition to the action alert and petition, we have visits. So the action alert and petition are written tactics, and then the visits are obviously in person. So there are district visits um, that all of you can do when your congressperson is back uh, during recess, and it's a great opportunity to do that coming up um, August 3rd to September 4th. And then Hill visits are visits that we do at, at Consumer Voice. So I hope that uh, tactics are, are something that you can have fun with. They can be um, created. Uh, created and creative, I should say. So that's the strategy chart and how we're using it for our 24-hour RN campaign. Um, next slide. Okay, now we're going to talk about the key elements of an effective advocacy message um, that we call the Big Six, and Mary Beth is going to um, take you through them. Okay, thank you, Robin. So I'm just going to give a very quick overview of the Big Six. Now, if you attended one of our other webinars, you'll remember these points. These are the key six items that should be part of any advocacy you do. So the first part of the Big Six is having an opening statement that includes your ask. So an opening statement is very important as you're going to want to get your audience's attention right off the bat with the faster statement. This normally should be only a sentence or two long and should be your lead in and opening. You want the statement to engage the person you're talking to. In addition, make sure to include a positive statement about the decision maker, the issue you're here to talk about with them, and the ask. The ask is where you tell the person what action you'd like them to take. So in our example today, the ask would be co-sponsoring to put a registered nurse in the Nursing Home Act. Next, you're going to want to present the problem that you reference in your opening. Lay it out for your audience. Discuss why it's important, who it affects, and what it does to them. You are then going to want to give the facts. So once you've described the problem, it's really important to give the facts about the problem, including any figures and or data you may have. Facts, figures, and data are really important because they help reinforce your position. The next of the big six is to give a personal example or story. This really helps to put a human face on the issue that you're talking about, leaving your decision maker with more than just cold facts and data to support your ask. You're also going to want to connect your message to something that your audience cares about, values, wants, or needs. For example, why should they care about the issue that you're asking them to support? What's in it for them? People are normally motivated to do things in order to get something out of it for themselves, their families, or their community. So what you're doing here is appealing to a person's self-interest. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. It's what motivates a person to act. So to connect the issue back to your audience, you're going to need to know something about their values, what motivates them, and what matters to them, their self-interest. This is where it's really important to do some research about the person before meeting with them, regardless of what type of decision maker that you're going to be meeting with. The last part of the big six is that reiterating your ask. You'll want to reiterate your ask um, after you go through the first five of these steps. This, again, is the action that you want your decision maker to take and what you included in your opening statement. It's important to reiterate this at the end of the message to remind who you're meeting with the next steps you want them to take. So there is a handout on the big six included in our webinar resources webpage that we provided to you to help you remember these key items. So now that I have given a quick review of how to craft the advocacy message with these important key six items, I'm going to turn it over to Robin to begin the main portion of today's webinar. Thanks, Mary Beth. So now we're going to talk about how you deliver your message uh, using both traditional approaches and social media. Um, next slide, please. 
But one thing before we go into more detail. I said earlier um, that we're using advocating for the RN bill with members of the U.S. House of Representatives, um, at, and we're using this as our training example. But that made us think that if you were to do this on your own, and again, we hope you will, you will need to know who your House member is if you don't know already. I would say that a lot of us don't know who our uh, U.S. member of Congress is. Um, in the house. So I think um, we wanted to let you know that a very, very easy way to find out is to go to this website, www.votesmart.org. Um, this website will give you a host of just a lot of information. Um, it'll give you your legislators um, at both the state and federal levels, um, and all you have to do is enter your zip code. So it really couldn't be easier. The other um, wonderful thing I think about Vote Smart is that it can help you do that research that Mary Beth just talked about. It will tell you you can access uh, positions that they've taken, um, bills that they've supported, uh, statements they've released. So it allows you to do that research to get a sense of what it is that they, they care about. So um, this is kind of uh, one-stop shopping um, in terms of uh, finding out who your member of Congress um, is and um, where they stand in their positions. Okay, um, next slide, please. All right, we're going to start by looking at traditional ways to deliver your message. And by traditional forms of communicating, we're talking about phone calls, mailed letters, uh, do you remember those? It's been a long time since many of us have actually mailed letters. Um, it, this includes also emails and letters to the editor. So we want to talk briefly about each of these different approaches. Next slide, please. Okay, let's start with the phone. There are two kinds of advocacy phone calls. The first kind is when you are simply trying to communicate support or opposition for a bill. This is quick and simple and can be actually considered a, a form of a robocall. So to do that, um, you can leave a message with the person who answers the phone at the legislator's office. It's as simple as that. So for example, uh, for our RN issue, um, I could say, my name is Robin Grant, and I'm a constituent of Representative Brooks. I'm calling to ask the Congresswoman to support H.R. 952 to put a registered nurse in the Nursing Home Act. And that's all I'd have to say. The staff in the member's office track how many calls they get for or against a bill. So you don't want to underestimate the importance of, of this kind of call. It um, does get attention and um, it helps because uh, members of Congress look at these numbers and it can influence their thinking um, on a particular issue. All right, the second kind of advocacy phone call is more substantive. So with this type of call, you want to go back to the big six that Mary Beth just um, reviewed for you. So what I want to do is kind of walk you through that big six in terms of a phone call and flesh it out a little bit related to the RN campaign. So you would start off with your opening statement and your ask. So you want to identify yourself at the beginning. You want to let the person you're talking to know why you're calling. Let that person know whether you're a constituent, an advocate, consumer, family member, or both. And then state why you're calling. So this, this all goes at the beginning. So with this issue, if you were calling to talk to, say, Senator Brown's um, health legislative assistant um, named Sean, you might say something like this. You know, Hi, Sean. Um, this is Anna Advocate. I'm a constituent of Senator Brown's and a member of United Senior Action, which is a statewide organization that advocates for nursing home care here in our state. So I'm calling to ask the senator to co-sponsor H.R. 952. This bill would require all Medicare and or Medicaid nursing homes to have a registered nurse on duty 24 hours a day. 
It's a very simple, straightforward bill that's really critical to protecting older adults and disabled consumers within your constituency. So opening statement with your ask. Then you move on um, in the big six to present the problem along with some facts. So again, I want to give you an example of how that might work with the RN issue. So presenting the problem and some facts might sound something like this. So right now, nursing homes are only required to have a registered nurse eight hours a day, seven days a week. And registered nurses are really critical to quality care for nursing home residents. Even though residents um, are often in very sick or fragile conditions upon admission to the nursing home, physicians are seldom on site and physician notification, if there's a problem, is entirely dependent on the assessment skills of the nurse at the bedside. And RNs are the only nursing personnel with the education and licensure to conduct those assessments. If an RN is on site, he or she can evaluate the resident's status, determine what's happening, and can often address the situation in the facility, which prevents an unnecessary and often harmful emergency room visit or hospitalization. At the same time, the RN can evaluate and determine if the resident should go to the hospital to get the treatment they need, which can literally save their lives. And we also know that higher levels of RN staffing improve resident care and thereby reduce the need for expensive treatments for preventable conditions. So that's the problem with some facts. Again, we are moving our way through um, the big six, and step four is to share a personal observation or a story. Um, as Mary Beth um, indicated, this is what um, puts the human face on the issue. You need the data um, to support that there's a problem, but you need the personal experience, observation, story to, you know, bring it home, to, to make it real, to make um, legisla legislators really, um, you know, feel in their heart why it's an important issue. So again, um, let's say I'm this member of a statewide advocacy organization. So I might say something like, the lack of 24-hour RN presence in nursing homes in our state is a serious problem. Um, in our state and also in your district. You know, I have heard heartbreaking stories from individuals in this district that have lost a loved one in a nursing home because there's been no RN on duty to properly assess and respond to their loved one's change in condition. In these cases, these residents were either sent to the hospital too late or changes in condition were not identified and responded to at all. And stories like these are all the more tragic because most of them would have been easily prevented had there been an RN on duty to appropriately respond to these residents' medical needs. Finally, uh, step five, uh, you want to connect to something um, your audience cares about and repeat your ask. So here's uh, where that research that Mary Beth talked about comes in. You want to find out. Um, what, what your member of Congress cares about, what their uh, issues are. So you might link it back in this particular case of, of the RN um, coverage. You might say some things like, we know that reducing health care costs is an issue that's very important to Senator Brown. And because higher levels of RN staffing are associated with fewer hospitalizations and therefore decreased health care costs, which the senator wants to achieve, we'd like to ask her to co-sponsor H.R. 952. Finally, then you want to make sure to ask what the best way to follow up is um, so you know um, what you should be doing after the call, and you, of course, thank the person. Okay, so that's a, a longer, uh, more substantive uh, call. That would be probably something that you would set up in advance. You would call, um, ask for um, the health um, 
you know, staff person um, who, who covers issues related to Medicaid and Medicare and set up a time to talk with them so that you know that you'll have the time you need to have this longer uh, conversation. Okay, next slide. All right, in terms of mail and email, again, you want to follow the big six and your message and content will be very similar to what we just discussed. But I want to mention um, a few points about the effectiveness of mail and email. Next slide. So on this slide, you'll see what I call the effectiveness ladder. So aside from an in-person visit or a direct conversation with a staff person or member of Congress, the very top of the effectiveness ladder in terms of delivering your message the absolute gold standard is a letter. So again, we're putting aside the visits um, or the, the direct phone calls because those are the, the, the top of the top of the top. But in terms of email and um, letters, the top rung is the letter that you've written that tells your story and in a very uh, personal way and why this issue is important to you. So for a while after the anthrax scare, it took letters to members of Congress forever um, to get there because they're being irradiated. Now they're still being irradiated, but letters are getting through much more quickly than before. But even better, if you send a letter to your member's district office, it'll reach your member of Congress much more quickly. And you can find their district office and DC office addresses by, um, you know, you could just Google it and put in something like Senator Susan Brown's office locations, um, and that will pull up the information you need. Your letter doesn't have to be, and in fact shouldn't be long. One page is best, but do not underestimate how important a, a letter actually is particularly since they are so rare in this day and age. So going down one rung on, on this effectiveness ladder is emails. We know that um, letters are better, but that being said, um, we know that folks are really busy and that writing a letter may not be possible. So in that case, uh, send an email, but if you can, send an individualized, personalized email written in your own words. So going down another rung is a personalized pre-written message. So this is a form email that um, you would receive maybe from an organization like us um, that has a pre-written message in it. But what makes this different is um, that you personalize it a little bit. And Mary Beth is going to talk with you um, and show you how you can do that in just, just a moment. The lowest rung on the effectiveness ladder is sending an email with the pre-written message that has not been personalized in any way, shape, or form. It's the pre-written message that you get uh, from an organization, it tells you what to say, and you just send it. So while it is on the lowest rung, um, I, I want to point out just a couple of things. It's not that those messages don't help, and in fact, they are particularly helpful when there are lots and lots of them. They're just not as effective in general as a letter or personalized email. But, and this is your takeaway, you take away nothing else from today, take this away. If your choice is to either send a pre-written form email that you don't personalize in any way, shape, or form, or to do absolutely nothing, it is far, far better to send the email because action is always, always better than no action. So if you have absolutely no time and it's send this pre-written message or do nothing, please click that button and send the message. Next slide, please. And finally, um, just want to take a very quick look at letters to the editor. They can be a good advocacy tool um, because they can spread your message to a large number of people. You can um, write a letter to the editor to accomplish a number of different things. You could do that as a way, as part of a strategy um, to try to get others to take action. You can do it to try to influence just in general public opinion. 
you might write a letter to the editor to provide more information and educate the general public about a particular issue, or you may use it to actually influence policymakers um, directly or indirectly. Letters to the editor are often, and um, often best, in response to something that's appeared in the newspaper or an online publication or, or a magazine. So if you read an article and it you see that it can be tied in any way, shape, or form to your issue, that's when it's good to write a letter to the editor. So you should actually make a practice of monitoring your local, state, national news to see if something appears that you can use. And if it does, you then want to pounce on it and pounce quickly. Because if an item is in the newspaper today and you send your letter to the editor in weeks later, First, people have long forgotten what the original article was about, and second, the newspaper is probably not going to print it because it's old news. So act and act quickly. Uh, next slide. Just um, some tips about writing uh, a letter to the editor. You want to start off by making sure you get their attention. So the first sentence is important. As one of your um, handout shows, um, we've given you a sample letter to the editor, and its first sentence is, right now, nursing home residents in many nursing homes could be at risk 16 hours a day. So saying that residents are at risk 16 hours a day, I think is shocking, and should make people want to read more. So number two, um, second tip, you want to put all your important points up front, and that's because it um, your letter may have to be cut, and you want the most important stuff to stay in. But it's also because readers have a very short attention span. They may only read the very first part of your letter. So if you don't get your message across there, you might not get the message across at all. So the third tip, you want to make sure that you tell people what kind of action they can take, because it's a great opportunity to mobilize readers. So in our sample letter to the editor, we say, you know, tell your U.S. congressperson to co-sponsor H.R. 952. Again, we are telling people specifically what action to take. Tips four and five go together. Um, you have to keep the letter brief. This, um, the sample we gave you is about 300 words. Uh, that's generally um, what you can expect, 250 to, to 300 words. But the key here is that you need to check the publication guidelines. The length varies according to publications. So check with the paper or online or wherever and um, find out what uh, the number of words is. Um, number six, connect the issue. So again, this is like what Mary Beth had said, to connect the issue back to the politician. Um, here, you're connecting the issue back to your community. Um, so for example, if there's a story about you know, a nursing home in your community that had a really bad inspection, you could connect that to the RN issue, for example, by saying that uh, one way to improve care is by having an RN 24 hours a day. Tip number six, as we've seen with visits, phone calls, letters, emails, always important to use statistics and personal stories to make your case. And finally, you need to identify yourself. So you want to make sure you write your full name um, and title, if appropriate. Uh, include your address, phone number, email address, because most publications are going to contact you to confirm that, that you indeed wrote the letter before they publish it. So with that, um, I'm going to turn things over to Mary Beth to talk about action alerts and social media. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Robin. So I'm going to talk a little bit about action alerts. Action alerts are a way to get others to deliver an advocacy message for you. So an action alert is a message that an organization or even you as an individual can send to mobilize people. Often members of a group, uh, supporters of a specific point of view, or just family and friends and contacts of an individual, calling on them to take action to influence public policy. So while action alerts are generally used for policy work, there's no reason they couldn't be used to generate messages to a long-term care facility administrator or company or to be used to do any type of other advocacy that you may be interested in. So in terms of writing an action alert, there are some things that you're going to want to keep in mind and certain things that you should include um, depending on where you are in your campaign. 
So first and foremost, information based on where your campaign is. So for example, if this is the first time your audience has heard about your issue, for example, if it's the first time we're reaching out to our audience about the 24-hour RN issue, we're going to need to provide some information and education about the topic. Now if you introduce the issue that you're sending out the alert regarding to before, that new developments have arisen, then it's appropriate to share some information um, that should update your audience. So if Let's say, for example, we would be sending out an action alert now about the 24-hour RN bill. Well, we know that it's garnered some additional co-sponsors, so we might share that information. Also kind of let people know where it lies in committee and maybe type of, the type of advocacy that we've done at this point and what we'll need to do in the future. So again, information based on where you are in your campaign regarding your issue. Also, you're going to want to keep it to one page or less when you send out an action alert. So you can measure this by looking at the email and print preview if need be, but you just want to keep it short, as short and sweet as you can. I know sometimes it's a bit complicated when you're dealing with issues related to long-term care, but as short as you're able to make it and still cover all these points, that is ideal. You're also going to make it readable by using at least a 12-point font and keeping the wording in layman terms. So try to avoid jargon and technical terms that people may not understand. Um, so give it just a general test of an individual that may not be in the long-term care field. Think about and someone that you might want to send it to or someone's feedback that you want to get. Could they understand it um, on the first read if they weren't familiar with the field of long-term care um, or anything kind of related to what your advocacy issue may be? You're also going to want to make sure when you're sending an action alert out to put the most important information in the first paragraph. So again, what the issue is, what action is needed, and what you're asking that individual to do, and the main message. So I'm going to show you a draft action alert in a moment, and, and we can kind of review this and see how this works and how we put the main information in the first paragraph so people know right away what that issue is and what action they need to take. Ideally, you'll also want to provide a date by which the action needs to be taken. Because people check their emails at different frequencies and may see the alert late. Now, sometimes um, in the actions that you're going to be doing, the date is going to be unspecified, so that's okay. But if you're able to provide a date by which the action can be taken, that's always useful. So lastly, you're going to want to make sure your recipient of the action alert is given all the tools they need to take that action. So if it's about a bill, give them the bill number if applicable a phone number to call if you're asking them to make a phone call, an email address or a mailing address if you're asking them to email an individual or write to someone and just using general mail. It's also very important to tell them what to say. Um, so give them a draft message that they can send to the person that they're going to be contacting. And they can personalize it, and we'll talk about that in, in just a short while. But just getting them started with a draft simple message for them to use that's always helpful. So here's an example of an action alert that we actually sent last year concerning the 24-hour RN bill. Um, you can see, as I was mentioning, it's fairly short. Um, it is contained to one page. The information in the first paragraph, we're giving them brief information on the issue, as well as telling them what that action is that they need to take. Now, we have further information towards the bottom after we link to the action if people want some more information about the issue. But right away, you can see in that first paragraph, we let them know what the issue is and what the action is that needs to be taken. And we also have a date um, to take the action by. So you see in this case, it was by September 8th when we wanted people um, to reach out to their members so they know right away what they need to do and when they need to do it by. Um, and also, you can see we included the link to the action. So I'll show this one a little bit in a little while, um, but once they click on that link, it gives them all the tools, as I mentioned, to take that action. So it's going to give them the bill number, it's going to give them a draft message, it's going to link them to a page where they can actually just enter their zip code, and the message um, will then be going to their individual legislator. So again, giving them the tools that they need, making it as easy as possible for whoever opens the action alert, whether it's members of your organization, whether it's just family and friends. Um, and always make sure, of course, to explain the issue up top and let them know right away what you want them to do. 
Now, who should you send an action alert to? So when considering who to send an alert to, if your organization or your program keeps a database or email list, then sending the alert to people on those lists, provided they've given you permission to email them, is always a great way to start. Also, you want to make sure to check your list just to see if your target is on there. So with smaller organizations um, that may have databases or email lists, sometimes the actual target, the person that you're wanting people to advocate to may be on that list. So just always double check to make sure that the emails and the action alerts that you're sending out aren't going to the target in that particular case. There have been instances of this happening, and while it's not a huge deal, um, you just ideally you don't want to send that to the target to let them know that you're asking people to advocate to them. Um, so if you are an individual or organization that doesn't keep a database, database um, always start with family and friends and ask them to forward to a relative or another friend. It's a great way to start your advocacy just by reaching out to families, friends, and colleagues and then asking them to forward on. Now if you're targeting a specific facility or an administrator, you could message the community listserv near the facility or a resident listserv or a family member listserv if there is one. Um, you can also consider using a tool like Constant Contact which is an online service to help collect email addresses for future outreach. At Consumer Voice, we use an online platform called Salsa Lab. So it is a paid platform. We do have to pay for it, but it helps nonprofits and political campaigns to advocate, communicate, and organize online. And that's the tool that we use to be able to keep our database, our network membership, and send out those action alerts for advocacy. Now let's look at what to do when you receive an action alert. So first you're going to, again, receive that email that's called an action alert. So as you can see, here's another kind of draft action alert um, that people are going to receive. And once they click on it, they're going to be taken to an action page. So the action page is going to be where someone is going to take that action. Again, this is through our service at Salsa Labs. Um, you may have a service that does this something similar, you may be interested in doing one, but for the action page in our case, we have a service that allows us to enter in a zip code. Um, so you can see, again, we're kind of giving them that general information that we had in the email as well, and you can see there is a place for them to enter in their zip code. And when they do so, they're actually going to be taken to a page, the page is going to refresh, and they're going to be taken to a place where they have that draft message already ready to go to the legislator and it will pull up their specific legislators. Now again, it's perfectly okay if you don't have a paid service like this or if you want to do something simple, you can maybe link to a page. You can just set up a very simple web page giving them information about the issue, maybe some more information, more than you would want to contain in an email. And again, maybe giving them a phone number to call, an email address to call, uh, to write to or perhaps a mailing address to write to or even just linking them maybe to votesmart.org or another website like that, letting them know you'd like them to look up their written official um, and, and, and write to them and, and contact them that way. So there are a million different ways that you can do this, um, simple ways, and you don't have to set up an action page if you don't have the resources to do so, but it's a great way to kind of give some further information and further resources. But if you want to contain that in the email, that's perfectly OK. So as you can see, again, we have that draft message. So this is just a plain vanilla message that people can click and send to their legislator. And again, this doesn't have to be put in an action page if you want to just maybe provide a sample text within an email of a message for people to send, if you want to just attach maybe a Word document, or, or just get it out any way you can. But basically, I just want to get um, get through that you don't have to have an action page. You can do this a lot of different ways. Um, but as you can see on our page, we do have that message ready to go. But we always encourage people um, to personalize this. And you can see at the top of the page, we ask people to personalize the letter um, and let them know that you know how important that is and in different ways that they can maybe do that. So with regards to personalizing an email, that responds to action alerts, we're going to walk you through how to personalize it um, related to the issue of 24-hour RN coverage. Again, personalizing an email message is helpful because it helps put that human face on the issue. 
and it helps whoever you're contacting um, kind of be more invested and understand why specifically you or whoever is contacting them cares about the issue. So if you can personalize the message a bit, that's obviously preferred and excellent. But keep in mind that action, whether it's personalized or not, is always better than no action. So if you don't have the time to personalize the message, or if the individuals that you're reaching out to don't have time to personalize, that's perfectly fine. Just having them take an action is better than no action at all. Um, but if they can take just a minute or so to personalize it, it always makes it more meaningful um, and it garners more attention. So in order to personalize at a minimum, you're going to want to identify yourself and then maybe add a personal story, observation, or experience um, to the message. So right now on your screen you can see an example um, and we also provided an example, a longer example in the link to the web page. There's a resource, a draft, a uh, personalized email that, that you can see. But this is from the perspective of a long-term care ombudsman. So this is kind of showing how a long-term care ombudsman, for example, could personalize a message and, and make it more impactful. So in the first sentence, you see that the long-term care ombudsman right away identifies herself. So it's as a long-term care ombudsman within your district. So right away, the legislator who's receiving this message knows um, specifically why that person cares about this issue and also that they're a constituent. So you can see um, in the non-bolded text, that's just the standard message. So the next paragraph is just a standard message. And then the next paragraph is what that long-term care ombudsman added um, to kind of share her, her personal experience with this issue. So they wrote, having been in a number of nursing homes as a long-term care ombudsman, I've witnessed firsthand what it's like for residents to not have round-the-clock access to RN care, particularly during evening shifts. Although certified nursing assistants and licensed practical nurses play important roles in the care of residents, they cannot fulfill the role of an RN. I have heard directly from family members and residents that important resident care needs have gone unmet due to the lack of an RN presence. I also know of cases where residents had to be sent to the hospital because there was no RN on site who could properly assess residents' conditions. Residents need access to RN care all day, every day, and this is why HR 952 is important. So as you can see, and again, after this, the non-bolded text is, is what is in that draft message. And she reiterates in the last paragraph, again, her position as a long-term care ombudsman um, and what, sh what she has personally witnessed regarding this issue to, to make it stronger. So adding these personal details to the message just makes it all that much stronger. It kind of shows her authority, why she is knowledgeable about this issue and, and what, how more specifically it affects the lives of residents and family members in this legislator's district. So this is a very powerful example of how to personalize an email related to 24-hour RN coverage. So now that we've kind of walked through how to maybe personalize a, an alert message, um, we're going to give you some time right now to kind of participate in this yourself. So we want you to think of this through the perspective of a family member who has a loved one in long-term care. So you might already be a family member of someone in long-term care, but if not, we want you to kind of imagine the scenario. And think of a sentence maybe that you could add related to 24-hour RN coverage from the perspective of a family member. Why would a family member care about this issue? So again, be very creative. It doesn't have to be something that you witness personally, um, but think about a sentence that maybe could be added on to an email about 24-hour RN coverage, making the case for why it's necessary from the perspective of a family member. So you have in your right, again, right-hand side of your screen a questions and chat box. Um, so if you want to take a few minutes, kind of think about something from this perspective and maybe type a sentence, and we'll hopefully share a few once you guys feel comfortable sharing. So feel free to submit them within that chat um, and questions box on your right hand side of the screen within the next few minutes and we'll share some.
So here's one that's come in from Mary Short. So her sentence is, from a family member's standpoint, I find it terrifying that licensed staff is not currently required 24 hours a day. So that's a great introductory sentence um, from a family member that could be used for this issue. So thank you, Mary, for sharing. Um, so I'm going to give everyone just a few more minutes um, if anyone feels like sharing. And then, unfortunately, due to time, we'll have to move on. Okay, so here's another example of a sentence that could be used as a family member of a nursing home resident. I have been in the facility at times where residents have not had access to a RN when they press their call button. So that's another example of something that can be used from the family member's perspective, again, something that they've witnessed themselves. Um, so thank you all for contributing. Um, unfortunately, we're going to have to move on right now, but again, thank you for working with us on that activity. So now we're going to move on to the second part of my session, which is talking about how you can use Facebook and Twitter to deliver your advocacy messages. So Facebook, as I'm sure many of you are aware, is a website that allows both individuals and groups to create their own pages to share all sorts of content they select. So that's text, video, photos, polls a wide range of content with people that subscribe to their pages. So as of April 2013, there's over 1 billion individuals using Facebook. And it's a great way to communicate because you are the reporter and the publication. So the potential is great for Facebook to use as a medium. And if you choose to use Facebook for your program or cause, you should expect, if you're able to, um, to post a thought on a relevant issue or topic, a related article, et cetera, at least once every few days, um, ideally once a day. But not everyone has the bandwidth to do that. And I know we certainly don't post every day on our um, Facebook page. So once every few days, if you're able to, to keep your subscribers engaged. Now, again, with Facebook, it's great because you set all the rules. Who can see what, what you post and what other people can post your page as well. The challenge is, however, that you are one person of a group of 1 billion users using this service. So standing out is hard, but it can be done by attaching engaging images with your post, and again, posting great relevant content um, that people will be interested in. You can also promote posts on Facebook. That does cost money. Um, so acquiring subscribers, people that will like your page and then follow the content that you share, can also be tedious at first as you're competing against many others doing the same. But one way to get people to subscribe to your page and to like it is by liking like-minded organizations' pages um, and asking them to like you back. Another simple way um, to get subscribers is just to email your contact list asking them to like your page. You could ask directly, ask Facebook friends via Facebook message to repost a message or to take an action. So even as an individual, Facebook is great for advocacy. You don't have to set up a page for an organization or a cause. You can simply share information on your own personal page, sharing actions for people to take, um, and sharing different advocacy goals um, that you're working on. So if you don't um, have Facebook, certainly encourage you to look into it, um, not only for your own individual advocacy, but potentially for your organization or program if you're interested. So right now we're going to do something a little interactive. I'm going to pull up on my screen our actual Facebook page. Here is a screenshot of our Facebook page, um, but I'm going to take you there live and just show you how you can share an action alert on your Facebook page. So right now I'm pulling up uh, the Consumer Voice action page. Um, so it's right here. And as you can see, I've already kind of typed in some language to share on the 24-hour RN bill. So this is our Facebook page. It's facebook.com backslash the consumer voice. 
So if you haven't already liked our page, we certainly encourage you to do so um, because we try to post, again, relevant content for our subscribers about issues related to long-term care that, that we think they'd be interested in. So we'd love for you to like our page and get involved. So right now, you can see that I have some draft language up um, related to an action that we want our network to take. So again, it's sharing that basic information about the action, um, what we need them to do. And we have an, a link included in that text to get people to go there. So again, you're going to want to keep that information short and sweet. Attach a picture if you're able to, but if you're not, perfectly fine. So I'm going to go ahead and click Publish with this action. So as you can see, it's kind of taking a little bit of time. And then it will go live on our page, and it will be available for everyone to see. So I think that published. I'm just going to reload the page here and see if we got that going. There might be a little bit of funkiness on my end. But as you can see, hopefully in a second, it's fairly easy to do. And it's something that I apologize. My screen is acting. Here we go. So you can see we're refreshing the page. And the post will be right there. Um, again, it's short content, uh, a picture if you're able to, but it does provide that link and get people to take action and help support what you're doing. So we just wanted to do that little interactive activity just to show you how easy it is to do Facebook and use it for your advocacy. So unfortunately, I have to go back to the slide that I was on. OK. So again, if you haven't liked our page at the Consumer Voice, uh, search for us on Facebook. It's a great resource and very much encourage you to check it out for your own advocacy. Moving on now, we're going to start talking about Twitter. So Twitter is where individuals or groups can create an account that allows you to submit microblogs of 140 characters or less called tweets out to anyone who subscribes to read your post and to the general public. So keep in mind that post length matters when you're using Twitter. Um, so you can only post, unfortunately, 140 characters. Now, if you're using a link or a URL in your message, um, you can use services such as bit.ly, bit.ly, um, to use links shorter. But also, Twitter automatically shortens any URL to 22 characters. Again, Twitter is a great form of communication because just like Facebook, you are the reporter in the publication. So the potential is great for Twitter as a medium. If you choose to use Twitter for your program or cause, or even as an individual for your advocacy, you should expect to post in a high campaign mode maybe three to five times a day. Um, now, on regular days and things when you're not in a high campaign mode, that's obviously going to be less. And that's really up to your discretion how much you want to use it as a medium. So some organizations are successful with fewer tweets unless an action is needed or taking place. This would be considered beginner 10 times or more, a bit much, and probably wasted time unless you have a devoted following. So similar to Facebook, standing out is going to be hard on Twitter. But you can do so by using popular hashtags or tweeting the key players in the field. So a hashtag is used on social media sites such as Twitter. And it's a word or phrase preceded by a hash or a pound sign. And it's used to identify messages on a specific topic. So for example, hashtag long-term care, hashtag nursing home. If people are searching for these terms on Twitter, um, your tweets will come up if you do use these hashtags. So it's a great way to get people's attention. Now, define key players in the field, other organizations, programs that you may be interested in seeing your page or, or following theirs. You're going to want to do some research around on Twitter to see who's tweeting about topics you're interested in. For example, with today's topic, we could search for nursing home, maybe nursing, staffing, 24-hour RN, to see who else is tweeting about the issue that we're concerned with. And you can just use that search in a search box on Twitter.com to find those like-minded tweets and organizations that are tweeting about the issues you care for. Again, acquiring followers on Twitter can be tough, but like Facebook, you're, you can start by following like-minded organizations, keep people in the field that you identify through searching for them, and asking them to follow you back. You can use Twitter to tweet messages related to your advocacy work. And we do have some examples. Now, again, with Twitter, 
the key is keeping it short and sweet because you are limited to 140 characters. So as you can see on your screen, there are some great examples of some very short tweets that you, we could send out in support of the 24-hour RN bill. So the first one is simply ask your resident, representative code sponsor HR 952, the Put a Register in Our Send Nursing Home Act, and then provides a link. And the other two are likely similar. Now, unfortunately, because of the limited length of tweets, you don't have a lot of time to kind of explain the issue. So what you can do is link to a page that provides some more information to the advocacy issue that you're working on, along with kind of information on how to take action. It's really up to you. But because there is a shorter link that you're going to be mandated to follow, it's always nice to kind of link to a page that has more information because people are generally more interested in an issue, learning more about an issue before they take action. Now one great resource that you might have heard of is a tweet storm. Um, and this is actually catching on in the advocacy world. So using Twitter to start a tweet storm, for those of you who may be unaware, a tweet storm is a coordinated action by many users to send the same tweet out at the same time generating a storm of tweets. So anyone can call for a tweet storm. You just need to decide what the tweet will be and what time it has to be sent. Also, if you're targeting a specific person to send that message to, you're going to want to determine that ahead of time as well. It's essential to choose the time that you know a lot of supporters are usually online. Once you've decided what the message will be and the time that you want to start have pe people sending that out, you're going to tell people about the tweet storm, ask them to get involved if they're able to, and spread this idea to their followers. Then you can either keep the tweet storm text somewhere handy and send it out at the appointed time, or schedule them tweets to go out at the set time and provide people with that information beforehand. So for example, going back to our advocacy examples, let's say we wanted to do a tweet storm around the 24-hour RN bill. And getting, generating a lot of people asking individuals to write their members of Congress about the bill. So maybe let's use the first one again as an example. In a tweet storm, we might send this message out to our followers beforehand, asking them to log on to Twitter and to tweet this message out at a, a certain time. Or we can simply wait until the appointed time, message this on our page, and ask people to, to again support it. But we want to do some thought beforehand if we're going to go through a tweet storm to try to do advocacy, because it's particularly more difficult maybe than other forms of advocacy, you want to kind of prepare beforehand. Um, so again, this is something relatively new, um, but it is catching on in the advocacy world. So I just wanted to share some simple information about that. So now that we've walked through all of this, I know in particular the social media stuff can be a bit confusing. Um, so we want to open up to question and answer, and myself and Robin will be available to answer any questions you have. Again, your lines are muted, but you can ask any questions or make any comments in the questions and chat feature on the right-hand side of your page. I know we're a little bit over time, so I'm just going to hopefully um, stay with us if you have any questions, and we'll, and we'll kind of work on going through these. Um, but so this is Robin, Mary Beth. I just would say mm -hmm. that um, we, we obviously know that um, we were scheduled to end at 3.30. Um, so we are going to continue, as Mary Beth said, um, I think to 3.40 at the absolute latest to allow some time for, for questions. But we certainly understand if you do have to leave. And if you do have questions um, and have to leave, please email us, and we will um, make sure to get back to you. So um, let's see if there are any questions. OK, thank you, Robin. So going through now, so the first question comes from Robert Graham. He asks, can secondary decision makers be considered not able to say yes, but are able to say no? So individuals that can say no to your ask um, but can't say yes, could they possibly be considered secondary decision makers as well? Uh, this is Robin. I guess I would say that by definition, secondary decision makers are those who can say yes or no. Um, so not not just half of it, but but both yes and no. Mary Beth, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, I would I would just support that. So normally these are individuals that can say yes or no. Um, 
So, so I think that in your case, it, it could be considered. Um, and also, I don't, so I know Amanda has done a great job of answering many of the questions that we've already had. So it doesn't look at this time that we have any additional questions. But again, if you have a question, please ask at this time. And we're more than happy to take a minute to answer. Um, but if you have any questions following, you can, of course, get in contact with us. And we'll share some information shortly. Um, so I see another question. Someone specifically asked if the HR 952 was nursing home specific. Um, and the answer to that is yes. Um, we're, we're, of course, concerned about nurse staffing and other settings as well. Um, but the Put a Register Nurse in the Nursing Home Act is specifically tied to nursing homes as they receive Medicare and or Medicaid funding. So does anyone have any additional questions? Okay, looks like not at this time, so we're going to move on. And again, you'll receive our contact information in a moment, so you can always follow up with us that way as well. Okay, next slide. Okay, well, we're, um, we're going to close now, so just a few points. Uh, we hope you've learned a lot and that you'll start applying what you've learned in your own work and to um, our campaign to put a registered nurse in the nursing home. So um, next slide. Well, this, we'll keep it on the slide. Look for action alerts from us um, as part of our campaign. And if you're not part of our action network, uh, we urge you to join. So all you have to do is go to our web um, site, www.consumervoice.org, on the right-hand side, and scroll down and click and join. Uh, next slide. Okay. Um, this is uh, was the uh, third of four webinars. So the fourth and last webinar will be on August 27th, and it will be about how to grow, support, and activate your network. So look for information coming your way about um, that last webinar. Next slide. As Mary Beth said, um, please feel free to email us with any questions. But also, uh, if you have questions about your advocacy efforts, uh, if you need more help or information, please contact us. So here is our contact information, which will um, is in um, your PowerPoint. And next slide. Finally, just thank you. Thank you for taking time out of what we know are very, very busy lives and schedules to join us today. And finally, just thank you for all the work that you do. We know that um, you are devoted, committed advocates, uh, and we know that that's not easy work. So please know how much it's appreciated. So thank you, thank you, thank you. And with that, we'll close and uh, hope you have uh, a great rest of the day. Thanks a lot.